Hi, I'm Jim W6LG for Ham Radio Basics. Welcome to my radio room classroom here on Wolf Mountain. This video and nine others are going to form a set of 10 videos covering the 10 elements in the general class license pool. The reason for doing this is I have some friends who have been so far unable to pass the general class exam. And I believe that the way I'm going to read these questions and the correct answer and offer a brief explanation as to why that is the correct answer will be helpful to them. And, and my goal is to have them watch this video, go through the questions with me uh, a couple of times, and then be able to sit for the exam and pass. The goal for the exam is to pass the exam. You're going to learn as an amateur radio operator pretty much every day something. Something's going to come up uh, as you build your station, make antennas, get on the air, operate, uh, help out during local disasters. That's when you learn how to do things. At this point, the idea is to pass the exam. So to that end, I'm going to be reading the question and the correct answer and pretty much just the correct answer and I'm going to offer a very brief explanation as to why I think that is the correct answer. In some cases I've been around 55 years and I know why something is the way it is. For some of the questions I simply won't know the answer. It's something new to me um, and so we're both going to learn as we get there. Again this video is going to be broken up into 10 episodes covering the 10 elements in the general class license pool. With respect to the answers, the answer that they give as the correct answer for purposes of the exam is the correct answer. There's no point in trying to argue a, a, a fine point with the a, a VEC because you believe another answer is correct. The answer they give is the answer that we're going to use. So let's get started. Uh, I'm 69 years old. I've been a ham for 55 years. If during this you hear me read the wrong answer or make a mistake, please let me know and I'll go back and correct the video. It's certainly possible to do that. Uh, again, I'm going to read the question, the correct answer, and offer a brief explanation as to why I think that is the correct answer. So let's get started. Uh, let's have fun doing it. And again, I'm hoping that if you go through these videos a couple of times, you're ready to sit for the exam. All right, here we go. Here's question number one from each one of those. It's fairly well divided. There's 10 categories uh, as to what they are. It, as far as I'm concerned, it's not important for passing the exam. So here we go. Okay, on to the first question, G1A01. On which of the following bands is a general class license holder granted all amateur frequency privileges? We talked about eliminating some of the answers. Um, on A, 20 meters is divided uh, to different portions for different uh, for extra and general class license, so that eliminates A. Uh, B also can be eliminated because 40 meters is also divided. Uh, D, uh, 15 meters is also divided. So even though I said I wasn't going to read the uh, the incorrect answers, in this case this just shows how we can eliminate the wrong answers. It's C. Uh, question G1A02. Which of the following bands is phone operation uh, prohibited uh, and this is one that you're going to have to memorize, and it's just a digital band, and that's uh, B, 30 meters. G1A03, on which of the following bands is image transmission prohibited? Uh, sort of like the question before that, we're back to 30 meters. Uh, the answer is B. G1A04, which of the following amateur bands is restricted to communications on only specific channels rather than frequency ranges, uh, and that is 60 meters, uh, a, a different band from all the rest, but uh, again, that's one that you'll probably have to memorize the uh, the answer to, uh, unless you've been on the air a lot. 
G1A05. Which of the following frequencies is the general class portion of the 40 meter band? This is a good example of um, eliminating a couple right away. First of all, 40 meters, you may know, is 7 megahertz. So C and D can be eliminated. Um, question, or rather, answer number B or answer letter B is beyond 40 meters. That leaving us with just A as the correct answer, 7.250. G1A06, which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 75 meter phone band? Well, we can eliminate a couple of them. Uh, the correct answer is C. Uh, again, just to point out um, why uh, sometimes there are quite answers that just are so far afield they can't possibly be right. In this case, you can Im immediately elim eliminate A because it's beyond uh, 80, 75 meters, and D because it's also beyond. So uh, the correct answer is C. G1A07, which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 20 meter band? Um, uh, Okay, so that would be C, 14305. Uh, again, you can this is CW, this is uh, not part of the uh, phone band, and this is um, uh, above uh, 14350, which is the top of 20 meters. Just to point out again, um, you can limit a couple almost immediately, leaving you with two. One of them is the right answer. G1A08, which of the following frequencies is within general class portion of the 80 meter band? General class portion of the 80 meter band, that's C, uh, 3560 kilohertz or 3.56 megahertz. G1A09, which of the following frequencies is within the general class portion of the 15 meter band? Uh, this one's really easy because the only one that uh, is has 15 meters is C, 21300. G1A10, which of the following frequencies is available to a control operator holding a general class license? And it splits on to two pages. Um, this one is one where all of the above is the correct answer because this says general class licensee and these are frequencies available to a general class licensee. G1A11, when general class licensees are not permitted to use the entire voice portion of a particular band, which portion of the voice segment is generally available to them? Just as a general rule and the answer is B, the upper end of the band, almost I can't think of a band where that isn't the case. G1A12. Which of the following applies when the FCC rules designate the amateur service as a secondary user on a band? And that's C. We are not allowed to interfere with the primary users. We are secondary. We cannot cause interference. So amateur stations are not allowed to use the band. Sorry, let me read that again. Amateur stations are allowed to use the band only if they do not cause harmful interference to primary users. Um, the adjective harmful, I'm not sure what that means, but I would just suggest no interference. G1A13, what is the appropriate action if, when operating on either 30 or 60 meters, a station in the primary service interferes with your contact? The answer is you move. D, move to a clear frequency or stop transmitting. You are a secondary user. G1A14, what, in what ITU region is operating in the 7.175 to 7.3 megahertz band permitted for a control operator holding a general class license? And the answer is region 2. G, uh, let's go down. G1B01, which of the, uh, what is the maximum height above ground to which an antenna structure may be erected without requiring Notification to an uh, to the FAA and registration with the FCC provided it is not near uh, a public use airport. And the answer is 200 feet. 
that's the maximum height that the ed structure may be erected. Um, are you likely to put up an antenna over 200 feet? Probably not. G1B02, which of the, but just remember 200 feet. G1B02, with, uh, with which of the following conditions must beacon stations comply? Uh, and there, and that's D, there may be no more than one beacon signal transmitting in the same band from the same location. So it's, you're allowed one. G1B03, which of the following is a purpose of a beacon station as identified in the FCC rules? Uh, beacons are obviously for propagation, uh, and so it's A, observation of propagation and reception. G1B04, which of the following must be true when an amateur station may provide communications to broadcasters for dissemination to the public? I've done this uh, more than once. And the answer is A. The communications must directly relate to immediate safety of human life or protection of property, and there must be no other means of communication reasonably available before or at the time of the event. Um, it's a narrow definition, but basically uh, life and property has to, has to be at risk, and there's really no other way to take care of the communication. G1B05. When may music be transmitted uh, by an amateur station? Uh, the answer used to be never. Uh, it's changed a little bit uh, because of spacecraft, and this one was a new one to me. When it is incidental, when it is an incidental part of a manned spacecraft retransmission. Uh, when I started amateur radio, there were no spacecrafts, and so that's a uh, far afield from what I know about. G1B06, when is an amateur station permitted to transmit secret codes? Um, the answer again is far afield from what I know about. When, uh, when you're controlling a space station. G1B07, what are the restrictions on the use of abbreviations or procedural signals in the amateur service? And the answer is, they may be used if they do not obscure the meaning of a message. Um, my answer would be, in general, if you're participating in an, in an emergency, and in general, uh, plain language is a great way to go. G1B08, what, when choosing a transmitting frequency, what should you do to comply with good amateur practice? And in this one, it's all of the above. Um, and that is that you, um, you're on the right frequency, that you've got the proper mode, that you're following the, ex the generally accepted band plan. Uh, that's a little bit iffy. Monitor the frequency before transmitting. Yes, listen before you transmit and then ask if it's in use. Uh, my rule is three times. G1B09. When may an amateur station transmit communications in which the licensee or control operator has a monetary interest? And the answer is when other amateurs are being notified of the sale of apparatus normally used in an amateur station, such activity is not being done on a regular basis. Um, it really speaks to a swap net which meets and uh, it's not the same stuff every time it's guys selling their equipment and, and that's okay. G1B10 what is the power limit for beacon stations and that's a uh, hundred watts uh, just think about the uh, generic transceiver being used for beaconing a uh, hundred watts. G1B11, how does the FCC require an amateur station to be operated in all respects not specifically covered by Part 97 rules? Um, and the answer is C, in conformance with good engineering and good amateur practice. Um, G1B12, who or what determines good engineering and good amateur practice as applied to the operation of an amateur station in all respects, not covered by Part 97 rules. The obvious answer is 
the FCC. They, they will make the determination. G1C01, what is the maximum transmitting power an amateur station may use on 10 dot, uh, 140 megahertz? And the answer there is a 200 watts PEP, and that's, um, adjacent to the, um, uh, frequency standard. So uh, we certainly can understand the, uh, the limitation imposed at that, uh, at that frequency. G1C02, what is the maximum transmitting power an amateur station may use on the 12 meter band? Um, and the answer is full 1500 watts peak envelope power, PEP. G1C03, what is the maximum bandwidth permitted by the FCC rules for an amateur station transmitting on USSB in the 60 meter band? The answer there is 2.8 kilohertz. And in 2.8 kilohertz, you can transmit uh, really good audio. So there's no reason to be wider than that, frankly, anywhere. G1C04, which of the following limitations applies to the transmitter power on every amateur band? The answer is A, only the minimum power necessary to carry out the desired communications should be used. That's an answer. That's a question and answer that's been around forever. Uh, you, you're supposed to use the minimum power necessary to complete the communications. G1C05, which of the following is a limitation on transmitter power on the 28 megahertz band for a general class control operator? There, it's full power. C, 1500 watts PEP. GC106, which of the following is a limitation on transmitter power on the 1.8 megahertz band or 160 meters? The answer there again, 1500 watts PEP. G1C07, what is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RTTY or data transmission on the 20 meter band? And this is one that um, I did not know the answer to. It's a fairly slow 300 baud. So when you see this question, uh, it's going to be 300 baud. G, C1, G, C08. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RTTY or data transmission at frequencies below 28 megahertz? Uh, same answer, 300 bods or baud, I should sing it. G, C09. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RTTY or data transmission? On 1.2 meters and 70 centimeters, there we're into uh, 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 UHF, and the uh, the rate increases. The answer is a 56 kilo baud. G1C10. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RTTY or data transmission on the 10 meter band? And that one is kind of an exception. It's 1200 baud. G1C11. What is the maximum symbol rate permitted for RTTY or data transmissions on the two meter band? Um, we, uh, the answer is B. Now the other question dealt with UHF. This one's dealing with VHF. Instead of it being 56 kilobaud as we saw for UHF, it is 19.6. G1D01. Who may receive credit for elements represented by an expired amateur radio license? A. Any person who can demonstrate that they once held an FCC general, advanced, or amateur extra class license that was not revoked by the FCC. G1D02, what license examinations may you administer when you are an accredited VE holding a general class license? Well, there the answer would be the next class down, which is C2.
technician only. G1D03, which of the following band segments may you operate if you are a technician class operator and have a certificate of completion for the general class license privileges? The answer is C, on any, on any general or technician class band segment. So, um, on which of the following band segments may you operate if you are a technician class operator and have the CSCE completion for the general class privileges? Well, there's the answer right there. You have the general class privileges. So C, you can operate on any, on any general class or technician class band segment. G1D04, which of the following requirements for administering a technician class light? What are, which of the following is a requirement for administering a technician class license examination? The answer is A, at least three general class or higher VEs must observe the examination. G1D05, which of the following must a person have before they can administer a, a VE exam for a technician class license? The answer is D a general class license or higher, which just makes sense. One class up. G1D06. When must you add this this um, when must you add the special identifier AG after your call sign if you are a technician class licensee and have the CSCE for the general class privileges, but the FCC has not yet posted the upgrade to their website. The answer is A, whenever you operate in the general class frequency range. So if um, if your call was uh, KK6KKK, uh, uh, you would sign a KK6, uh, KK6, KKK slash AG or AG after your call sign. G1D07. Volunteer examiners are accredited by what organization? Uh, and the answer there is a bit tricky. It's not the FCC. It is the Volunteer Examiner Coordinator. So it's the VEC. G1D08. Which of the following criteria must be met for a non-U.S. citizen to be an accredited VE examiner? The answer is B. Must hold an FCC-granted amateur radio license of general class or above. G1D09, how long is a Certificate of Successful Completion of Examination, CSCE, valid for an exam element credit, credited? And the answer is a year, 365 days. Question G1D11, a person has an expired FCC issued amateur radio license of general class or higher. What is required before they... I guess it's they. They can receive a new license. The answer is is D. The applicant must pass the current element to exam. G1E01. Which of the following would disqualify a third party from participating in stating a message over an amateur station? And the answer is an amateur whose license has been revoked. G1E02. When may a 10 meter repeater retransmit the 2 meter signal from a station having a technician class control operator? Only if the 10 meter control operator holds at least a general class license. license. G1E04, which of the following conditions requires a licensed amateur radio operator take specific steps to avoid harmful interference to other users or facilities? The answer is D, all of the above. When operating within one mile of an FCC monitoring station, when using a band where the amateur radio service is secondary, when, tr when a station uh, is transmitting sped... <laughs> when a station is transmitting spread spectrum emissions. G1E05, what types of messages for a third party in another country may be transmitted by an amateur station? 
And the answer there is C, only messages relating to amateur radio or remarks of a personal nature or messages relating to emergencies or disaster relief. Uh, things like, hi, I'm okay, or uh, uh, you're re relaying a message from someone uh, that uh, Vlad is okay. Those kinds of things are all right. G1E06, which of the following applies in the event of an of interference between a coordinated repeater and an uncoordinated repeater? And here's the answer. A, the licensee of the uncoordinated repeater has primary responsibility to resolve the interference. And basically that's going to mean moving the frequency. G1E07, which with which foreign countries is third-party traffic prohibited except for messages directly involving emergencies or disaster relief? And the answer there is when the country uh, prohibits it. It's not a listing. This one is every foreign country unless there's a third-party agreement in effect. Okay, G1E08. Which of the following is a requirement for a non-licensed person to communicate with a foreign amateur radio station from a station with an FCC-granted license at which an FCC-licensed control operator is present? The answer is B. The foreign amateur station must be in a country with which the United States has a third party agreement. And that's the key to the answer. Third party agreement. Uh, G1E09. What language must be used when identifying your station if you're using a language other than English and making a contact using phone emission? Um, okay, let, let's rephrase that just a bit. A voice transmission. And the answer is C. That's the obvious answer. English only. All right, that question was removed. G1E11. Which of the following is an FCC term for an unattended digital station that transfers me messages to and from the Internet? And that is C, automatically controlled digital station. Now, this one's new to me. Which of the following is the FCC term for an unattended digital station? And the answer is automatically controlled digital station. G1E12. Under what circumstances are messages that are sent via digital modes exempt from Part 97 third-party rules that apply to other modes of communications? Okay, this one is clearly under no circumstances. So it's A. You're not exempt from Part 97. G1E13. On what bands may automatically controlled stations transmitting RTTY or digital em emissions communicate with other automatically controlled digital stations? Um, the answer is anywhere uh, from one point Two five four forty um, U anywhere in, uh, UHF and above. So anywhere in the one point two five meter or shorter wavelength bands, and in specified segments of the eighty through two meter bands. So there are some segments where that is permitted. 